So diving inside our first input, we've dialed down the life expectancy to 0.1 and you can see that is set on impulse activation and the way you set it is that you go into all points and use the first context geometry. Inherited velocity is this. And I haven't really updated or changed anything on the pop solver. But on the pop object, I've selected use object transform. So while this object that's generating points is moving, by selecting use object transform, it, the points will move with the original objects. And then I've done the heaviest part of the simulation, which is the particle fluid surface. This node is very finicky. And based on what parameters you select, you can have a very heavy simulation or a very light one. In this particular case, we have a mix of both. The settings that I have currently are the ones that work with my computer, so keep that in mind when you work with particle fluid surface as well. Um, so already you can see we've got some very Jupiter-esque formations forming on the surface. When we flip over to particle fluid surface, we have particle separation is this, and the volcal scale and the droplet scale are these parameters. Scrolling down, those are pretty much all the changes I made. I also want to check something on here. Oh yes, before we move forward, I want to mention the pop nets. Um, in order to get the simulation to work properly in the way you intended for it to sense all the particles, you want the start frame to start a little bit before um, you actually start your simulation. So in this case, mine was negative 45. So this is starting at that stage in the simulation. I then cached out this mesh and I've transformed it where I want it, which is in my geometry down here. Um, again, you could easily do this at the beginning of the simulation, but when I was building this, this just kind of worked easier for me. Um, so we've transformed it into place. And then finally down here we have an attribute VOP. And what this attribute VOP is for is that we're diving inside and we're basically creating the velocity on the surface here. So you can kind of see the velocity trails that we really want just so when we apply motion blur it looks correct and already we kind of have a problem where in this one particular area we don't see anything <laughs> um so that could be caused by our fit stop and it is so if you wanted to change that i would recommend deleting this but yeah that's where you'd go to set your velocity and we're going to remove that And then finally, this is what it kind of looks like with the, the really messy temp gate that I've designed. So that's pretty much what you can do for a resting gate at its state. So jumping upwards, we're going to work into the dynamic gate, which is that beautiful kind of explosion of particles and things that we just saw here. Um, so we're going to do that and we're going to dive right inside and you can see that I've organized it into three groups. Uh, one is the emitter, one is the dynamics, and the other ones are the post-processing on the actual simulation itself. When I approach a simulation, I like to think of it kind of like a three-step approach. What is the emitter like? What is the dynamics like? And what is the things I will have to do to it afterwards to get it working? Um, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of like three, three step approach that you would see in color grading or with the Da Vinci Resolve. So keeping that in mind, let's jump right up ahead into the emitter. So, all right, so we standard started with a circle here. And if you look at the circle, the, the only thing that's really changed is division size. So that is 39 divisions. Um, and what this does is just gives it a finer detail around the edges there. Um, and that's great. And that's great for just smoothing out your polygons. So then we've subdivided this, which you can see right here. We go to a depth of three. We've added a scatter. So we've scattered some points onto here, which I've had about 3,000 points just to be safe. The relax iterations are turned on. 
Okay, so over here you can see I've done something sneaky. Um, you won't really notice <laughs> what I'm doing unless you have your visualizers turned on. So if we look over here, you won't really see anything because before the null, nothing's happening. But if we skip down here to our attribute wrangle, you can see a lot of things starting to happen. And one of them is that we're adding velocity onto our little sphere. And basically what this is doing is creating a normal value and then just saying normal equals velocity. And we're using the controls on our null up here to control our attribute wrangle. And we're just animating that over time. So at the height of it, the gate exploding, we have the velocity turned all the way up. And then over here we have it turned down. Um, you could ask my, me why I'm not putting this on the wrangle itself. In this case, I just wanted a no controller because I liked it that way. So now we're going to do a little bit harder of the simulation, which is generating the .NET. I'm always a big fan of legacy pyro. Um, so in this particular case, I'm going to do something that I've used in a lot of tutorials before and show you how to make your own .NET for legacy pyro inside a geometry node. And basically what we want to do, if you want to create a legacy pyro setup within a geometry object, there is one easy way to do it, and that is by putting down a .NET, diving inside, going up to here on the legacy tool shelf to pyro effects, jumping up to the highest point on your um, hierarchy, clicking billowy smoke, and you'll notice it starts to cook and all of a sudden if it's already inside your node and you can jump up and it's generated these emitters for you plus it's put everything inside the stop nets and you can dive up here go to the pyro import and copy paste these nodes back into your original node so i hope that makes sense but that's pretty much how you can put your own legacy pyro inside a custom node but in this case, we're not going to use that. We're going to use my setup, but I'm going to go over you, go over the settings with you. So going down to create density, these are the particle separations and the particle scale and the density scale and the temperature scale. Then we go to add noise, it's taking density and temperature and it's remapping them with some noise. So those are all the settings for that. And then we're going to rasterize. And then we have the attributes rasterize up here. The voxel size is really low. And we have velocity blur turned off. And that's pretty much it. And then we have it going out. Then inside our dotnet over here, we have some interesting things happening. Um, we have our regular density, which comes in with our little dynamic gate setup that we generated from our little tool shelf up here. Uh, but in this case, I've animated a lot of things, so I'll kind of go over them with you. I'm going to switch this over to manual because I don't want things cooking out while I skim through all my keyframes with you. Up until frame 45, I have the scale for the velocity put at 2. And then at frame 72, I have it put at 0. So that's kind of what the height of our simulation is going to be at. And if we jump up here, I've told Houdini to shut off the source smoke after frame 76. And that's pretty much what this function is doing. So you'll notice after frame 76, it shuts it off, which is great. Because we only really need the velocity from this, not really the density. Then I've added some gas turbulence, which is, this is pretty much all the changes I did, which was crank up the scale just a little bit. I added the pop force. Um, and I've animated this force over time. I've gotten all these amplitudes turned down. Uh, but if we go to 38, we can see the force is put out of 3. And what this is basically doing, if we jump over to our camera, it's just projecting the smoke this way towards the camera. And then in frame 62, it shuts off. I've added some pop drag, and that once again at frame 48 is set at 0. And then this is set 
at 45 at frame 100 so it can just slow the whole entire simulation down as it comes to a resting state. For the resize container, I've kind of turned this off. I don't really need it. Um, I just have that in there just in case I do. For the pyro, we've turned down the division side to 0 0.05. Um, and that's pretty much all the changes that are needed on here. For the pyro solver, this is where things get interesting because there are a lot of keyframes on here. So you'll probably want to pay attention for that. They all start at frame 36. So if we jump over to simulation here, we'll start off with the simulation tab. So for th frame 36, we can see the buoyancy and the buoyancy direction are animated. For frame 51, we see the time scale is still set at 1, buoyancy lift is put down to a 1, and the buoyancy direction is neg negative 2. For frame 62, you can see the buoyancy and the buoyancy direction are all put at 0. The cooling rate is starting to drop just a little bit, and the time scale when we get to 100 is at 0 0.5. So if we jump over to shape, we can see some interesting stuff also start to happen. At frame 100, we have disturbance is at zero, turbulence is at zero, swirl size is at zero. Turbulence is at a one. I'm gonna check these other tabs to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, yes. Um, this disturbance, uh, we've added some cutoff and block size changes. Um, as well as the control range. That's a little bit different. And the dissipation, we've changed up to a 2 as well. So if we jump over to here to 682, we can see that our turbulence has started to change as well. So the dissipation is at a 13, turbulence is a 0 0.1. 62, these changes are made on this level. And at 38, the dissipation is 0 0.08. And that's pretty much all the changes that are made on this section. For the advanced area, nothing has changed here. And that's pretty much it. I'm just going to delete this merge node because we no longer need it. Jumping up to the surface, you can see the start frame is 0. Um, you can put it at 1 if you feel like it. It doesn't really make a difference. Uh, but that's pretty much it when it comes to setting up the smoke aspect of the simulation. So we brought in the import pyro fields from the node we discussed earlier. Um, and basically what this is doing is it's very important that you use import pyro fields because it will bring in all the attributes that you need for the simulation to work for particle evection. So you can see them right here. This blast node is blasting away everything but the velocity, so it's still eating non-selected. And what you can do is you can select it through, I'm gonna turn on manual so we can do that. Um, but one way you can select these is by going through here and selecting what you want to keep for the particle infection. Circle. So over here, this is kind of the more important bit. So what we have here is our particle, you know, I mean, our particle infection, the start of our particle infection, which is import pyro fields. But we also have a circle over here. And this circle is gonna be our emitter for the particles. Um, we want it around the same size as the smoke or maybe a little bit bigger so we can have some overlap. And the circle is a polygon. You know, for scale is 0. Point, I mean a 1.6. A division is 32. And if we go down here, we're extruding it just a little bit and we're outputting the back. And really this is up to you of the distance you want to scale it back on. Then we're scattering some points, and we're scattering a lot of points, so we're about 30,000 worth of points onto that sphere. And the relaxed iterations is a 10. So we're feeding both of this information into a popnet. So by clicking the popnet, it's going to calculate both information. Uh, starting on the top half, we have sub-steps which are 2, scale time is a 0. 0, uh, scale time is a 1.6, 
And then if we dive inside, we have a basic setup for particle invection happening. For the source inputs, we've kind of animated the life expectancy just a little bit. Uh, because if you don't animate the life expectancy or play with the life expectancy at all when you're doing particle vection, your particles will just kind of stay where they are and hang in space. So um, you might want to consider their life expectancy to change. So I'm going to switch this over to manual so we can skim through the keyframes. Uh, but I'm also going to go to the source and I'm going to show you that the emission type is all points and we're using the first context geometry. Jumping up to the birth We've got the impulse activation. The life expectancy is about a 0 0.7 up until frame 33. At frame 55, it goes to 0 0.3. And at 82, it goes to 0 0.04. And then the life variance is at a 0 0.78. So now we've added a little bit more of some custom forces into here. We've added an amplitude of 5.92 and a swirl size of 1 on our pot force. And then we've added a secondary pot force that is adding some smaller swirls into it uh, with these parameters. And then finally our particle evection, which is using the second context geometry, we're updating the velocity and we're adding a velocity scale of 0 0.3 into there. For this, we're just using this as is. Uh, we don't need to use the object transform. And for this, nothing really has changed. So we're all good there. So jumping up to our pop net, I'm going to switch this over to manual. I'm going to go back down to here. Ah, there we go. So we kind of have our particle gate exploding. You can see the points. And if we go to a particle fluid surface, it's going to take those points and it's going to mesh it for us. Again, this step is really up to you because if your computer cannot handle the subdivisions, then I would say give your computer a break. <laughs> but we can kind of see the settings that I have it on are these. Um, so you can use that as much as you want. We're co converting this to polygons. A lot of the time I find that Houdini doesn't fully convert the particle fluid surface to polygons, so you do need to add a convert node at the end. And then what we're doing here is we're going to add some noise to this. And we're going to add additional noise onto the mesh simply because we need it. We need some finer details in there, not a lot, but just enough to kind of say to our sim, hey, I need some bigger pieces of noise. So we can see already our gate is exploding. We've got some nice little effects happening and some bubbles. We're gonna bursting effects. Um, I know it's not clearer of um, the noise or extra bumps you're seeing, but if we switch over here, we can see them happening in this area. And that's kind of what we want, just a little bit more bubbly effects. So if we dive into here, we have a few things happening. We have an um, anti-alias noise being plugged into position. We have a fit that's fitting it in this particular area that we want. And all the source mint is doing is just, the higher it is, the less bumps you're gonna see. The lower it is, the more bumps you're gonna see. So just play around with that and see with what you see fits. And for the anti-alias noise, we've cranked up the roughness and offset just a little bit. And we're promoting the frequency and amplitude up to the surface. We're displacing it along the normal so we have this going on, um, and then that is going getting plugged into our geometry output, which is our position. And what we are doing is we're am animating the amplitude of our noise. So it's going to start, I'm going to switch this over to manual, and we have it starting at frame 24, going to frame 47, and 72. And that's pretty much it. I'm going to go back to frame one there. <laughs> the next thing I did was VBD from polygons. And what this is doing is just remeshing our little simulation. So the extra details we've added can be part of the mesh and look more cohesive. And we've dialed down the voxel size this big. 
Then we're converting it to polygons, which is going to reduce its size even more. And then we've added another point bop, just for some more added detail. Um, we could even add this before the convert top. I think it would work better that way. So we will. And <laughs> we'll push it into here. And we can kind of see that there's more noise happening on our surface. So we once again have animated some things and I'll go over that with you in a second. And we've got a little bit more of a compl complex version of the previous wrinkle, uh, previous bop that I showed you prior. So we have some anti-alias noise plugged into the position. If you look at it, those are pretty much it. We're fitting it, so the source max is this. Again, totally customizable and up to you. We're adding some curl noise, which is once again plugged into the position. So looking at the curl noise, these are the parameters. We're then adding these two things together. And then we're fitting them. You can kind of see without the fit where it is. Um, and the fit, the source min, the source max are promoted to the surface. We are then displacing these with the position and the noise. So these are going into here. And then we are outputting it to the position. And that's pretty much it. So again, we'll go back out here and we'll convert this all to polygons. And then we are saving this disk. And that's pretty much the overall shape of it exploding. But then we need to add a few more details because that's how we're like. <laughs> so we have a point VOP. And this point VOP is adding color information onto our little explosion. There's one thing I forgot to cover. I'm going to dive back into the additional point VOP for the app, the noise. And you can see that I animated it here, so we're just going to go over where these these keyframes are. So the first one is at 56, and the last keyframe is at frame 100, so you can see where they move. So diving over here, we have a point VOP that is built around color. So what it is doing, if we dive inside, we have the curl noise, once again, plugged into the position. So these are the parameters for that. We have Voronoi noise, plugged again into the position. We are feeding both of these into an add, which is adding them together. And then we have a fit, which is the source min and the destination min, just to clamp the color. So if we crank that up, we'll notice something happen, hopefully. So yeah, it got a little bit lighter. This is getting plugged into the color, and I don't think we need to plug this into the position because nothing is happening, so I'm just going to turn that off. So yeah, all this is going into the color on the geometry VOP output. We're blurring these together so we can have more of a freedom of what this looks like. And then the final VOP is not something you can really see, but it's adding our velocity back in and we're having the similar issue that we had with our resting gate which is a fits that fits up gets in the way of everything so we're going to turn that off i don't think we need it and what this is doing is just calculating the velocity that is exploding for the gate um, and it's adding it back onto there so we can have some accurate motion blur and what this is doing is just feeding the position into a multiply node, which is adding to it, multiplying it by a constant, which is 2, and that is getting fed into the geometry VOP output, which is going into the velocity. And then we have an outgate, and that's pretty much it. I'm going to delete that, we don't need it. So yeah, that's pretty much what the active gate looks like. So I'm going to cover more of the lighting and also the materials now if you want to hear that. Um, so we're going to dive into that. So I have a distant light in the scene, just because I want a directional lighting. We have some intensity that is lowered. We also have some transform data. We have an area light, which is not enabled, so I'm going to delete that. Um, we have a distant light. 
So the color is this blue color, and this intensity is one. The transform data is this. Environment lights. So we have it turned into a nice little blue color. I have a custom HDRI in the area. What it is is basically a screenshot from the show that I'm projecting around the Stargate so we can have the actual accurate blue glow from the show. Um, I haven't really rotated it or anything. And then the geo light is really optional. Um, I just took the geometry from the dynamic gates and I plugged it into the geo light. So if we enable it in the scene, you can kind of see it underneath. But basically what this is doing is adding a very little amount of intensity with a blue and I haven't really translated it or anything. And it's taking the dynamic gates information as well as its material. So that's all really we really need with the material. I mean, with the lighting, and I think we're good there. So, for the material, both of these are using the same chair, which is principal material one. And the geometry is using oxidized steel. So we're gonna cover those in a second. So you're gonna be asking me, why are we using a liquid for this? It's more of a liquid-based type of project. Well, I do find principal shaders are more customizable based on your own needs. Um, Meanwhile, other shaders in Houdini are a little bit more finicky because they are designed to represent a certain liquid or object or something like that. So keeping that in mind, I always use a principal shader to shade most things in Houdini. So if you take a look at this, um, this is for the liquid of the gate. It is a blue color. I cranked up the IOR, metallic and re reflectivity has changed. Transparency is lowered. Scrolling down, there's not really much emission. You go over to opacity, nothing has changed. Pretty much nothing has changed there. And those are pretty much the only changes really needed on the liquid in the gate itself. Going over to the oxidized steel, this is for the temp geometry, just because I needed something reflective in the backgrounds. Um, I've added some bumps and normals to that, so it doesn't really work because we don't have a map. But for the coding, I'll turn that off. Um, but for the base, I'm using a default Houdini texture concrete material. Um, and displacement wise, we've enabled some displacement noise, which is using alligator noise on the gates. Um, so we cranked up the amplitude there. Then we've added some roughness, we've changed the transmission color, and we've also changed the subsurface scattering color as well. And that's pretty much it for materials. And I think that's pretty much it for building a gate. So if you like this tutorial, my name is Kate, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.